If you could please turn in your Bibles, we're going to start out in the book of Revelation this morning. We will be going to Joshua chapter 7 directly after that. But for the time being, if you could turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we'll start in verse 9 and read through 20. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden sticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest, or the seven churches. Let's pray. Father, as we read this scripture here this morning, Lord, we come to you in prayer, not because it's ritual or tradition, but it's because we want to make sure that in this final effort before we come to worship with you that we, that we write our hearts that our minds might be captivated with the awe of the wonder of God being the first and the last. And Father, this morning I I would ask that each and every one of us would take a good hard look at ourselves. There would be a time of examination, a time to look into a mirror, not to see the faults or the shortcomings of one another, but of ourselves. See the picture of our Lord going through and walking through the golden lampstands, a picture of the church. Lord, I'd ask this morning that if you took a stroll through ours that you wouldn't find the things that would bring dishonor to you. Father, I ask this morning that you give me strength in this message, that you would give us hearts that are receptive to your word, not to my voice. That today we would really look at the sin in our lives and be anxious to rid ourselves for it. Father, I'd ask that you would just be with the Robinsons as they travel. 
Give them safe traveling mercies, Lord, and just bring a hedge about them today as they depart on a journey to serve you, to be servants and disciples in this far distant land. Would you protect our friends? Watch over them, give them strength in the difficult times. And Lord, as a church, would you help us to be mindful to pray? to hold up their arms whenever they get tired. And Father, be with those that are sick and ailing here today. Be with us and keep us safe here this morning as we bring honor to the Alpha and the Omega. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Private Sin, Public Consequences. And to be honest with you, I preached this about a year ago. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Kyle told me that. Um, And I don't don't normally preach stuff over if I can help it. But this just came in line with with the series that we're in in Joshua, so I'm going to preach it again. But we look at this passage that we read here this morning as already, and Revelation is an amazing testimony to the unveiling of Jesus Christ. When you pull back the veil of of who Jesus Christ really is. And the the love and the care and the compassion that he he gives to his church and to his people. But also to to a God that is just in the fact that he will bring judgment onto those that have rejected him. It's a fact that, that we, a lot of us and, and maybe some in this church and maybe some outside of this church, they haven't come to the fact to realize that God is a God of judgment as well. That's what this passage speaks of this morning as we see Him wander through the seven golden candlesticks which are called churches. And if you look at that passage, it's very familiar. I know that you know this already, but I'm just going to go over it. But you have to pay attention to verse 15. It says, And his feet are like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. What does, what does brass symbolize in the Word of God? Judgment. Judgment. This picture is a picture of Jesus Christ being completely and totally sinless. A man that was killed because of our sin was taken to the cross and he was judged because of our sin. But he walks through these churches with feet uh, described as like brass or as of judgment. And I ask you this morning, as the, as the psalmist said in 139, 23, and 24, Search me, O God, and what? Know my heart. Know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way inside of me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So if, if Jesus Christ was to come into our church today physically... And he was to walk up and down the aisles, maybe maybe go down through the pews. And he was to walk among the golden candlestick of East Sunsbury Baptist Church this morning. What would he find? I'm not talking about the sin that, that other people know about you. I'm talking about the sin that only we know about ourselves. What would he find dwelling in the hearts of us here this morning? Would he find bitterness, hate, animosity, maybe discontent, a a lack of faith? We could go on and on and list, list all kind of sins that he might find in each and every one of us this morning. But it's a picture of how hidden sin in the life of the believer. This morning when we look at this man named Achan. How hidden sin can not only affect that person, but his whole family. It can have collateral damage to everybody around him, and it can even happen to our church. Now, if you would go back with me to Joshua. Go back with me to Joshua, chapter 6. 
Now, we was in six last time that we met, which seemed like forever ago. But we was in chapter 6, and we went through the fall of Jericho. We went through this very familiar story on how God knocked down the walls of Jericho, this amazing fort, this, uh, this amazing stronghold. But we see the people follow in obedience to God, and what they do? They marched around for the first six days, one time, around Jericho. You remember the story? And then on the seventh day, what did they do? They marched seven times around. But God told him, listen, when you march all those times around there, you can't say a word. You can't utter a noise out of your mouth. And we all determined, and even my wife told me on the way home, she said, yes, you would have had a problem marching 13 times around that walls and not saying a word. Because you got lots to say. And I do. It's not, it's not a slam. That's honest. That's an honest examination of who I am. I can't shut up sometimes. And sometimes it's not for the better. But he told him to go around those walls 13 times. And when you get around that, that 13th time, what do you do? Yeah, you shout. You blow those trumpets and you shout. And because of that, that great power of their voices, those walls came down. Right, church? No. It was the greatness of God that knocked those walls down that day. It was, it was a continuing episode after episode after episode in the Israelites' life of what God can do if we're obedient. Of what great things God can do if we would just listen to every detail of His Word and we would follow it to the exact letter of what God can do. But he also told them, and everything went well. We know the walls came down. But if you go in Joshua chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, we didn't cover this, but I didn't cover it on purpose, the last sermon, because it more relates to this week. Joshua 6, 18 and 19, it says, And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing. Make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold, vessels of brass, iron, they are consecrated unto the Lord. And they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So he told them, when the walls come down, you go in and you kill every person that's in there except for who? Rahab and her family, right? They go in and they kill everybody that's there. And a lot of people say, that's really gruesome. Why would God tell them to do that? That's just what God does. We don't question why God did it. He just did it. But he, he, they kill everybody that's there, except for Rahab and her family, and he tells them. Now, when you go in and you plunder, you don't take the spoils for yourself. You take them and you put them in the treasury of the Lord. Then you go down to the end of the chapter... In verse 27, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Everything up until this point is going well. We've seen them come through the different trials with the Jordan. All the different wandering experiences through the, through the wilderness. They finally come to their first conquest. They knock down the walls of Jericho with the power of God. And now we see that the, the fame and the fortune of Israel and Joshua and the Lord is noised throughout all the country. It's evidence that God was with His people at this time. But there's warning in all this. See, in the midst of great victories... And we've all had them as Christians, have we not? Have you not? How many have had great Christian, how many great victories in God in their life? Well, four or five of us. That's perfect. All right. I know that there's been more than that. But see, here's the thing. On the other side of those victories, that's, that's the most dangerous time. 
You come through those valleys. You come through those victories in life. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's illness. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's an addiction. Who knows what it may be? You come through those valleys in your life and you're on the other side of that Jordan. You're on the other side of that victory. And you think, now I can rest easy. It's the most dangerous time in a Christian's life. It was the most dangerous time for these folks. See, because when you move into Joshua chapter 7, the very first word tells you something has changed. What's the first word, church? But. But always means there's a contrast of what was just said. Something had changed from the story that was just told. You see the victories, the great victories and the blessings from chapter 6 and before. And then in chapter 7, you start to see the displeasure of God come forth in in verse 1. Look what happens. Verse 1, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. This was the spoils that was talked about in 18 and 19. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So here we see Israel get a little bit sloppy. They got sloppy in their walk with God. They come through the victory, they get on the other side, the walls are down flat, they're celebrating, praising God for the good things that He's done, and guess what they do? Somebody, one person, they took something that wasn't theirs. They went against the covenant that God told them to not do. He told them, the spoils that come from that war, you don't get them. They come to me. And the reason was, is because he was the one that provided that victory. He was the one that gave them that victory. But we see them take something that wasn't theirs. We see them go against the covenant that God gave them. And God was angry. It said that the Lord was kindled. That means he burned hot with anger. Now don't get me wrong. This is the righteous anger of God. This is not a deceptive or mean or malicious anger. This is the righteous anger of God going against his people saying, you defied me. I told you not to do this and you did it anyway. It's the worst kind, isn't it? As parents, when when you tell your kids and you tell them over and over and over again, I see a lot of parents smile and shaking their head because it's true. And you tell your child when they get to the other side and they did exactly what you told them not to, what do you tell them? I told you not to do it. But see, a lot of times what happens today is the parents say, well, if you do it, you're going to get this. And guess what? They don't get it. And then that child says, you know, I don't think they're going to punish me. I was that kid. I caught on to that stuff real quick. See, I want you to understand something going into this message this morning. When God said he's going to punish somebody because of their sin, he does it. And the same God that punished them back then, whole way back in the time of of Joshua, the same God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the last... The same God that punished those people in the way that we're going to look at this morning, He still punishes people like that today. Say, wait a second, you're trying to tell me that God would put us to death for our sin? I'm saying that He could. I'm not saying that He will. Let's look at verse 2. Everybody's like, oh boy, this is going to be a pleasant one. It's not, okay? I'm just telling you right now, it's not. But you know what? It can be the start of something beautiful in the life of the Christian this morning. It can be the start of something really special in your heart if you just go with it, okay? Verse 2, it says, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. 
Make not all the people a labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up a thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. So here we see Israel. They have the conquest of Jericho, and now they're going to go to Ai. But there's one thing they don't do. Each and every step of the way leading up to this point, we see God's instruction in the middle of everything. This time they, they get overconfident in themselves and they go to Ai without any instruction from God on their own merit, on their own abilities, in their own self-confidence and they say, we can take them because they're few in number. We can defeat them. Look at us. We're the great Israel. We have a, we're the chosen people of God. But you see, self-confidence can be very dangerous. How many thinks confidence is important? It is important when you go into a, 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 a sporting event or something like that. But if you go into that event or you go into a certain situation overly confident in yourself and God has no issue in it, you're going to fail. It's not your ability that's got you there. It's not your strength that's got you there. It's not your resources or your knowledge or all these abilities and strengths that we want to say that we've done. Without God, we can do nothing. But with Him, anything is possible. But we see them get overconfident and they go into Ai. And in verse 5, you see what happens. It says, And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the, in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Verse 6, it says, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, even unto eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore thou hast thou all at all brought this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we, we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the, the land shall hear of it and shall envire us around and cut off our name from the earth. What wilt thou do unto thou great name? We see the consequence of hidden sin. This is just like what I was talking about at the very beginning of the sermon. We see Jesus Christ walking through the seven golden sticks or golden candlesticks, and he has that feet of brass, that, that judgment. If he was to walk through this church this morning, if he was to walk through the, the church that we call the people in every single church this morning, what sin would he find? And would we be okay with it? But you see. In those few verses that we just read, we see the consequence of what happens whenever there's hidden sin in the life of a believer or in the life of God's people. They go to Ai, they, they, they go to this conquest and they say, we're going to take these people because their numbers are few, we're great in numbers, we can take them. And 36 people die. Now a lot of people have said, what's the big deal? It's only 36 people. Out of two million people, that's nothing. But 36 sons and daughters lost their fathers that morning. 36 wives lost their husbands that day. 36 of God's people died unnecessarily because of one man's sin.
Sin has collateral damage, church. And I told you, this, wasn't, this isn't easy for me to preach because guess what? I know that some people think that I sit up here in my righteous, my righteous perch and I preach to people and I don't have any sin in my life. I'm here to tell you right now, I got plenty of my own garbage to deal with. I don't sit up here in my self-righteous perch and point it out to you. I'm dealing with myself this morning. God's walking through me this morning and saying, what do you have to purge that's accursed in your life, preacher? And what are the consequences of my hidden sin? Brother Tim talked about discipleship this morning. You want to know why sometimes we don't grow as a church? You want to know why there's empty seats? He tells you in this passage. That hidden sin that, that we harbor in our hearts as believers, as a whole, as a church and individually. He tells them. I'll remove my power, and it'll hinder your victories. We're getting ready to talk about something that's incredible on Sunday nights in the book of Acts. The power of the Holy Spirit that came upon the church at that time. That's the most exciting book to preach in all the Bible. That same power that those people had in the, in the you know, New Testament church is the same power that we have here today. And yet, we relinquish that power because of the sin that we hide in our hearts. The sin that we hide in our lives. That we think that nobody else can see it. And most of us probably can. You don't know how I, what sin I struggle with. My wife does. I don't know what sin you struggle with. But the righteous judge knows. You want to know why the church doesn't grow by the thousands today? Because he's removed his power because he says, you know what? You walk around pretending to be something that you're not. You look like a Christian. But when I peel back the layers of your heart, you don't look like one. That's what was happening in, in this passage. First thing he tells them is this. He tells them, that Israel has sinned. We know that sin is, is missing the mark. That's in verse 11. Verse 10 it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded to them. He tells them first, you sinned, you missed the mark. Let me tell you something, church. There's not a single person sitting here this morning. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't, I don't care how long you pray every day. I don't care how many Bible verses you know. There's not a single person in here this morning that has not sinned and will not sin today, tomorrow, or the next. There's not a single person alive that's worthy to sit before God and say, I'm clean, Lord. He says, you sin, you miss the mark. God set a holy standard for them to follow. Don't touch the accursed thing. Don't touch it. It's not yours. And then he says, you transgressed against my covenant. It means to pass over, moving beyond the outside of the covenant bounds of God. So we miss the mark, and then we take it even a step further. That's what I just said about a, a child disobeying the parent, saying, you know what, don't do this, and they do it anyway. It's no different than us with God. He tells us, this is what you got to do. Listen, church, there is absolutely no mystery of what God commands us to do. He's given us the full counsel of God to follow in His Word and says, you know what, you do this. You keep my commandments. But see, these folks, they sinned and they missed the mark. But they went outside of God's covenant. That's why the power of God was hindered and brought about defeat in Ai. Practically speaking, We could look at that in ourselves today. 
Just take a self-examination of ourselves. Just start to examine yourself. Just start to let the Lord walk through your heart this morning and peel back the layers of your life and let Him examine where you fall short. I'm not talking about each other. Don't look across the pews. Don't look at your spouse. Look at yourself. Where can we be better? Where do we fall short? Where have we broken God's covenant this morning? And he says, I've removed the power from your life, from your marriage, from your kid's life, from your church, from your ministries. And there's going to be defeat because you broke my promise. We know the consequence of sin and we could go on with that for, for days. But if you look at verse 13, it says, gives us the confrontation and how to fix it. Verse 13, he says, up. In other words, rise up. There has to be a noticeable reaction to what happens. This is foreign in the church today. We don't do this in the church today. We don't, we don't deal with sin like God deals with sin. You say, well, that's, that's an Old Testament thing. That happened in Joshua. That don't happen no more. You go to Acts chapter 5 and you tell me that story. That's a New Testament story. You think God can't kill people or kill His people off because they've stepped outside of the bounds of His promise and out of His covenant? I'm here to tell you right now that He can. The God of love is also just. And He was in this fact. He told him, you stepped outside of that. And now I remove my power. <laughs> now I know what that black stuff is, Kyle. It's that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Verse 13, he says, Rise up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. How many of us are going into a battle here today, this week, this month, this year, whenever it may be, you're going into that battle with hidden sin in your life and the Lord's saying, no, 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 you don't. How are you going to put on the, the belt of truth if you're going to go into a battle? How are, you, how are you going to put on the breastplate of righteousness if there's, there, if there's unrighteous thoughts and motives in your heart? You don't go into a battle with just a partial armor of God. You go in with the full armor of God. And that's what he told him. You're going to be defeated. Why? Because you went in without power and you went in with unrighteousness in your heart. And I love how the confrontation is straightforward. It's straightforward. It's dealt with. And honestly, it's not a novel idea. This isn't something new. This is something that should be done in the, in the churches today. We wonder why we don't have power in our churches. It's because of the hidden sin. It spells it out plainly in God's Word. And I'm not preaching down to you. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Where could we be better? Where could East Sunsbury Baptist Church be better? I can't speak for any other believers in any other church. I lead this one. But if you look, he says to sanctify yourselves. Set yourselves apart. Get that accursed thing from out of, midst of, uh, out of the midst of the church or out of the midst of the tribe. And in 14 it says, In the morning therefore ye shall be brought according to the tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that, hath, all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath brought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning, brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. So here we see God confronts the sin, and he tells them this is what you have to do. It's time to set yourself apart. It's time to sanctify you and your tribe. Go and get it done. He says you go and you bring the tribes by, and who is it? The tribe of Judah. 
Verse 17, he said, he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zerites and he brought the family of Zerites man by man and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give I pray thee glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. And tell me now, what thou hast done, hide it not from me. I see the compassion of Joshua reflecting that of the compassion of our Lord. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men might count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish but all would come to repentance. I see the compassion from Joshua this morning when he, when he goes to Achan and he says, tell me, tell me what you did. We know. But see, I don't believe that he was truly confessing here. I believe that he was caught and he was, he was just owning up to what he did because he didn't have any choice. That's different than Repentance. But if you see something very interesting, verse 21, it says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver. This is, this is Achan reencounting the, 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 um, the act. And, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels, shekels weight that I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So, so Achan, he confesses to Joshua and says, yep, I did it. But look at the progression of the sin in verse 21. It says what? I saw. I saw what I wanted and I took it. This, you can go into the book of James and see the same progression of how sin develops and how it destroys and how it kills. But he says, I saw what I wanted and I took it. And then look what it says. It says, I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, 50 shekels weight. Then I what? Then I coveted. And I took them. Oh, if we would get to that point where we see what we want. We know that we can't have it. We know what God's word says. We know what God's word prohibits us from doing. But we see it, and we take it anyway. The same thing goes for us today. You think that there's not things that your preacher, or that your deacons, or your trustees, or the leadership of this church, you think there's not things that we struggle with in our daily lives where God says, don't do it! And you do it anyway. Church, I hate to tell you, but there's consequences for your sin, even if you confess, even if you're truly meant to, free, even if you're truly in your heart for asking for forgiveness. There still can be consequences because of it. Look what happens to this family. Verse 22, it says, So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran under the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. They took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua, unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all the Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his asses, his sheep, his tent, all that he had. They brought them unto the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? Which is what Achor means. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised him over a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor. Unto this day. 
Here we see the unfortunate cleansing of sin that was hidden. I don't know about you, but that's a terrible ending to a story, isn't it? We see a man that, that was commanded not to do something, and he did it anyway. And he hid these valuables in his tent. He got caught, and he lost everything. And his entire family paid for his sin. Now, I pray that God doesn't do that to me because I got a lot to answer for. You say, well, God would never do that to you. I'm in fear that he could. Because God does not change. He is a God of love. He sent his son Jesus Christ to die upon the cross because of our sins. And he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ through us. I understand that. But what power have we removed? What victories have we not won? What blessings have we not consumed because of the sin in our lives? We see the terrible consequence of cleansing from this hidden sin. And there was two things that came to my mind. Why the kids? Why the children? I don't know about you, I can, I can see war happen, and Brother Tim's been in war, and so many others. But when you kill children, why? And it's because sin's ugly. Why would God send his son to die like he did? He was a child of God, too. He died a horrific death because of my sin. He died a horrific death because there was no other way to pay for it. There was only one that could pay for that. If we could just finish out, let's go to 1 John. Kyle's been teaching through 1 John on Wednesday night. And if you know my story about being restored to the fellowship of God, some... 11, 12 years ago. These two verses are the verses that constantly plagued me that I, that I would cling to in my, in my restoration. Let's start in verse 5 of chapter 1 of 1 John. First four verses, you see the testimony to Christ, and then the first five it talks about, we see the, the light of God emerging. It says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. Do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, with, fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. If you know and you've been here on Wednesday nights, and if you've ever studied the book of John, it's, uh, one of the main themes is about fellowship. And he taught, you, you, if, you, if you keep God's commands, you love God, you love one another, you, you're, either, you're either not saved if you don't confess those, or if you are saved, you'll confess them. And we see, we see uh, the passage here being talked about that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. You know why the light of God doesn't shine so bright in churches today? I mean, if you look around our church this morning, our church literally could be full with the people that are missing, the people that have left, the people that have, that, that have done this or that or are mad at me, mad at you, whatever it may be. The reason there's so much darkness in the churches today is because the light of God has been extinguished because of sin. 
He's walking through those candlesticks and guess what? Half of them are out. And it's not because we don't have great ministries. We have a great church. You have great pastors. You have got a, you've got a great board. But you know what? We have to get rid of the sin in our lives. As a whole, as a group, as a people. What does he find when he walks through East Sunsbury Baptist Church this morning? He says in verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us. You want to come back into commonality with God, fellowship with God, have true fellowship with the, the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last. He says you have to confess, you have to come back into agreement with God. And he says he must forgive you. If you truly confess this morning, whether it's to be a, a, a child of God or whether it's to forgive, ask him to forgive you as something that you're struggling with. He says he will forgive you because he's faithful to do so. But we see the cost of hidden sin in this passage of Joshua this morning. I pray that it's a reminder for us as dads, as moms, as the pastor of your church. I hold a great responsibility to make sure that my heart is right before God in order to lead you and his as well. Are we where we need to be when it comes to having fellowship with God this morning? Let's pray. Father, as we close this message today, I know that sometimes, Lord, the things that we study and the things that we preach and the things that we learn, they're hard to swallow. Oftentimes we oftentimes we say that that's a hard pill to swallow, Pastor. But oh, if we would just take heed to your words this morning, and we would truly search our hearts, each and every one of us, make a mindful effort not to care about what anybody else is thinking, not care about what everybody else knows about us or thinks about us, but when we kneel at the feet of the righteous judge this morning and we see the, the shiny, refined brass of the master, what could we lay at his feet today and say, rid these wicked things of me, O Lord? As the disciples said whenever they sat at the Last Supper, they asked them, is it me, Lord? Is it me that's betrayed you? I'd ask this morning that each and every one of us would ask the Lord that in our way today. Is it me, Lord? How have I betrayed you this morning? Help me to have courage to confess it today. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gracious, long-suffering nature that you have for putting up with a people like us. And Father, this morning I'd ask that this morning that we would have a turning, a turning away from the sin that plagues our, our lives and our families and our kids. And we thank you for not dealing with, uh, with us in the way that you did with Ananias and Sapphira and and Achan, we're thankful for that today. But Lord, help us to stand in awe of you this morning and know that if we just confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. And we ask these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. I don't know if you'll need this or not. It, it might ring on you. Let's take a moment to respond to the sermon. Let's do this. You can just leave your hymn book in the, in the drawer while Pam begins to play.
She's going to play hymn 100, Jesus is all the world to me. And while she plays, if the Lord...